and gentlemen, welcome back to the only podcast not stuck in the Suez Canal right now. Welcome back to Doctor Who Reviews. Oh, no, no, uh, sorry, sorry, Raniac, it's, um, we're, we're in the canal. God damn it. Just yeah. when I thought we had a, a unique angle. Well, I mean, it is truly a unique angle. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, yeah. 108 <laughs> degrees. Uh. <laughs> Hit the rim shot. Thank you. That's such a t- that was such a, 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 a side to the, the reaction to the rim shot. Do I have to use it again? I'll go on then. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this week, <laughs> we're not stuck on a, on a tanker in the Suez Canal. We are looking at the Time Monster, the John Pertwee series of the Time Monster. And this is a trip. Oh, boy. I picked a fun one. <laughs> you you sure certainly did. did. <laughs> Who's here to talk about it with you? Well, it's funny you say that, because I'm joined by my two usual co-hosts, and they are, firstly, to my virtual left. He is the jack of all things and the master of none. It's Freezing Inferno. <laughs> so I'm a red mage. Neat. <laughs> if you like. <laughs> I understood that reference. <laughs> to my virtual right. What's that coming over the hill? Is it a monster? Is it a monster? No, it's Conker Usurper, better known as Cat. Excellent! Yay! Beautiful. And my sound clips. So... Of all the sound clips, you kept that one because, of course, you did. So, uh, course. the Time Monster. Yeah. Um... There's not really much history behind this. It's the final story of season nine of the John Pertwee years. That's the third John Pertwee season, if I have my math right. And uh, there's no real special like history behind it. The the one thing I do want to mention, we got to bring up that poll again. I keep dunking on this poll, but it's just every time I look at it and see the placement of these no. things, I'm just like, this is no. Thor's. Keep dunking. Yeah, keep dunking on it. It's very oh, simple, for us. Some things it's just to be dunked on. Some things I mean, to be dunked on. Listen, I, we were nice to the poll when we did remembrance and we agreed with it that it was a very very good story. But here's the thing. According to this poll, The Time Monster, the John Pertwee serial that we watched this weekend, is the worst John Pertwee serial ever made. Which is bullshit. Considering they have right. Inferno at number 16, uh, I have to call this into question. Two things about this poll. One, I can sort of understand, having watched it now, why they might think it's, it's ranked so low. And two, they're wrong. I wonder why. Well, I have I have my own theory on why they ranked it so low. But well, well did you watch it? Because that might be why they ranked it so low. Uh, here, here's a little something for all the poll people out there. Yeah. So <laughs> shall we? Shall we? Um, we get through the plot then, because because there's not much history to this. It's just that. It, it was ranked low on that poll, and it's the serial before the Three Doctors, which we've already done. Which is, is another good John Pertwee. It's, well, a good John Pertwee. Uh, I think yeah. it's, it's liked by fans. Again, Broken Clock, tw- right, twice a day. It's a good story. Yeah. We liked it. But this story opens with uh, thunderbolts and lightning. Very, very frightening. It opens with the exact same opening to Inferno. They've just, they've just ripped it off wholesale. Oh yeah, yeah, it does open with the same stock footage of volcanoes. So I didn't write, I didn't write that down, but you're right. This is the third time that they've used the volcano stock footage. It's the first time they've however set it to 70 synth pop. <laughs> Reminds me of that Jimmy Neutron meme. Behold, stock footage of volcanoes. <laughs> Doctor Who, this is the third week in a row you've shown us stock footage of volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> A Jimmy Neutron reference in 2021 will one day ever It's a, it's a very specific meme format, but yeah, this is a we open on an actual like premonition, a bad dream that the doctor's having. There's a shining crystal. There's all sorts of thunder, and there's Roger Delgado looming tall over him, being like, ha, 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 ha. I have ruined the world. I escaped. Yeah. I escape. We'll, we'll get to well, we'll get to I escape and to the Delgado Master in, in just a second. But this is a dream that the doctors have, or perhaps better say a nightmare. 
you laugh, but the last story he would have been in, which is season nine's The Sea Devils, literally has him escaping on a, 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 a hovercraft. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's it's usually the, the Anthony Ailey master that we associate with I escaped, but um, it happens to Delgado as well. Yeah, so he was he's been at large, but we've been focused on. I don't actually I don't even know what stories are in season nine that are like spacey weird stories. Uh, I don't know, but either way, either way, the Doctor, the John Pertwee Doctor, who, if you'll remember, at this point is exiled to Earth and can't really use his TARDIS. He's had this bad dream, and his companion, Joe Grant, the lovely Joe Grant, wakes him from it. And there's this really great moment where she's like, oh, Doctor, you're having a bad dream. Here, have a cup of tea. So he takes the tea. They have a bit of dialogue. He, he doesn't, like, sip from it or anything. He's just holding this uh, tea cup and saucer. And he sets it down, and he's just like, oh, thank you, Joe. That hit the spot. <laughs> I love that little touch. Yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, this is a very British show. And as far as I know, British just have to be near tea for them to feel better. <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, tea, tea is basically the oral year of life. Is it, uh -huh. is it like a, a peace offering whenever someone has an argument with somebody else to make them a cup of tea? Yeah, you, you can sometimes make up with someone over, over a cup of tea and a biscuit, yeah. There you go, see? Tea, it brings us all together. Unless you don't like tea, you drink coffee. This In which case, you just committed the war cry and good going. going. Neither, so, the, the doctor's still clearly disturbed by this uh, apocalyptic dream he's had, and he has Joe. Uh, he asked Joe to check out if there's been any earthquakes or volcanoes and stuff, and well, Cap and it's a bit of Captain Exposition, but she's like, oh, Doctor, you've been so busy working. I told you all about it, see? And she shows him a newspaper article about volcano activity off of Greece. Well, it's not just volcano activity off of Greece. Cause they're what else talking is talking about something else. Oh, what's that? It's Atlantis. Atlantis? Yeah. Home of... The goddess Amdo and fish people and guards with seashells? Well, not quite. This one's more of an Egyptian slash Greek Atlantis mix. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we, we should obviously talk about the elephant. The, the reason Cat picked this was it's another portrayal of Doctor Who in Atlantis. And Doctor Who being the ever so just ever so fucking faithful to continuity. The people behind this episode had no goddamn idea the underwater menace existed and just make up their own shit for it. Atlantis and how it was destroyed. Well, I mean, we could technically argue that this could be Atlantis in the past, but then, spoilers, it gets destroyed at the end. If you didn't know that about Atlantis, I'm sorry. Um, it's like saying the Titanic sank or something. Next, you're going to tell me Icarus flew too close to the sun. Jeez. I know, right? <laughs> or that uh, Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's dad. Welcome to the podcast, Ancient Greek Spoiler Edition. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I don't see any reason that they couldn't be connected. Because... Uh, uh, true, true. The underwater menace is already underwater. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then this one has is being destroyed. So well, there's also the fact. Well, n n never mind. I, I don't. I don't know where where the underwater menace thought Atlantis was. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. For, for all intents and purposes, I, I think we're... if I remember correctly, it was somewhere around maybe like the Bermuda Triangle. Like they were trying to say the Bermuda Triangle is the reason. Yeah, it felt it felt like that. Where this, this is clearly like ancient, close enough to ancient Greece. Um, they I mean, the you star and they pushed the city over there. <laughs> <laughs> and so we begin the SpongeBob memes again. And so we come back to SpongeBob immediately. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, never end. This is SpongeBob. Between this forever. and Jimmy Neutron memes, Raniac, Raniac, you need your own Nickelodeon memes. Rugrats. No. Rugrats. No. <laughs> Well, speeding through here uh, real quick. <laughs> yeah. 
if you would, Rainy. I was, I was about to say Reese's, then I realized that's a, that's a Disney Disney cartoon, not a not a Nickelodeon one. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Get us through the plot, Rainy. Yeah. So um, we, we've got the Doctor having this nightmare, and he and he asks um, he asks uh, the Brigadier about um, anything that's happened. Joe gives him the answer in the, in the newspaper because she gets a nice line she, when she she says. Uh, Unless I'm exceedingly dim, I'm thinking, no, Joe, you're not exceedingly dim. <laughs> well, I, I love Joe Grant. Joe, Joe kind of is very condescending to herself. Yeah. yeah. But there's a really nice um, <clears throat> vibe to her uh, partnership with, with the Doctor, with Pertwee's Doctor. We love them together. Like, sometimes he'll call her an idiot, but he'll do it, like, not particularly harshly. Hmm. Unless there, is, watching, there is care between them. Unless you're watching Terror of the Autons, but we're not watching that. Unless you're watching Terror of the Autons, which you shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> well. What's that? A suggestion for my next pick? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even that it's a shit story. It's just that it's their first meeting and she is kind of the bumbling idiot. Uh, yeah, he doesn't treat uh, Joe exactly well in that one. He, he warms to her later on, but... Um, yeah. Quote... Y- Quote, you've ruined it, you ham-fisted bun vendor. <laughs> okay, right. now you're making sure she picks it for her next story. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> well, anyway. if you want to double if you want to double dip down in the Pertwee era, that's fine by me, but the no, Brigadier, stop talking immediately. The Brigadier and friends are busy because there's this science presentation happening up at Cambridge right, of this new wonderful them? thing. Who wants to tell them what it's named? Okay, who on? <laughs> Shall I? Shall I? Yeah, please. You, you, you seem the most enthusiastic about this. Yes. So, this thing that a couple of scientists up in Cambridge have invented, it's basically a, a jank matter transporter made with 1970s technology. The beam, like, the practical effect of it right now is that it can beam objects from one room to another, supposedly, but there's more sinister underdogs to it. But I'm going to I'm going to get I'm, I I need to get the I need to get what the acronym I need to get what it stands for. I know what it stands for. Ah, they call it transmission of matter through interstitial time, but the acronym they use in the episode is Tom Tit. Amazing. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> It, it's like child. a raunchy 1970s sat nap. I love it. <laughs> I'm such a child. I can't stop laughing at that. Every single Can we talk about the scientists real quick? We're going to be... Yeah, 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 before we get to the, to the big yeah. reveal of who their boss is. Yeah, so um, the two scientists are Dr. Ingram mm-hmm. and Stuart Hyde. <laughs> I didn't catch Dr. Ingram's first name. Ruth. Ruth, yes. Ruth Ingram, okay. I, 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 I had a laugh at Kat's a comment on the actor who played Stuart Hyde saying he has the most 70s porn mustache ever. He does. He really does. I He's mean, on- if you look at this character, he is basically the 70s personified. Yeah. The hair, the mustache. And then there's the uh, portrayal of Dr. Ruth Ingram, which people yeah. have criticized. Uh, now, this is... Now, unlike certain stories, th- you can kind of say this was a product of its time. Unfortunately... It's not a very good product of his time. Uh, Dr. Ruth Ingram is what old British people in the 1970s think a feminist is. Yeah. Accurate. It's, uh, it's not. It I'm has sure not, shall we say. It's to what really bad feminists are now. It's uh, not the best look. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, that's the only character trait she displays throughout the entirety of the six parts. It's not the... It, it, it somehow manages, believe it or not, to not be the worst portrayal of feminism in Pertwee Doctor Who. Uh, that honor would go to The Monster of Peladon, a story where Sarah Jane Smith explains feminism to a queen. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> so... Wait, who, wrote that, who wrote that episode? Was it a guy or a girl? Oh, it was abs- it, like 99% it's a man. Like 99% of so writers on Doctor Who. A man had a woman Girls writing Doctor Who in the seventies. Mm. A man had a woman. It's written by to another woman. Brian Hales. 
Okay, we'll never do his stories then. Uh, That's... Is that right, Ronnie? Yeah, well... I don't know if he had some... If he touched uh, feminism in his other stories. Uh, he actually... Uh, he created the Ice Warriors. So technically, we already have... We, you and I, Ronnie, I could have touched the story of his. We did the Curse of Peladon, which is quite good, actually. Yeah, the Curse of Peladon's pretty good. The monster, not so much. Yeah, I, Monster of Peladon is not... But... I prefer Curse to Monster. Yeah, well... As, I, way, as do I. This is a weird character. She's. She, yeah, I mean. She's very much wanting to help everybody, and she doesn't seem to like the whole, you know, the women have to stay back thing. But she's also very derogatory towards men. It's. It's what I, a seventies old British person thinks of feminism. I get is. that, but I, I think I would like the character more if every other line wasn't somehow about disparaging the men that she was mm-hmm. around. Yeah, for for those of you who, out there who might be a little confused, I am a feminist because I believe in equality between men and women. As in, I don't want these two idiots here to be, you know, slagged off because they're men. I want them to be slagged off because they're idiots. Uh, also, thanks, I guess. Exactly the same. This, this, this is her way of complimenting us, Rainiac. Take it. Thanks, thanks for that backhanded compliment, Cat. We appreciate it. I also want to be treated exactly the same as them because I'm also an idiot. So I would like to be treated as an idiot, not because I'm a woman. <laughs> right, right, right. That is true feminism, is we're all idiots here, regardless of gender. <laughs> Bad feminism is when you start blaming men for all of women's problems, which... Okay, so technically you could, but that's more of a systematic problem than it is strictly men, because there are also women who try to keep down feminism as well. I, I think I think what that one says is you've just kicked off fifth wave feminism. We're all idiots. We're all idiots here. Feminism means that I could stay at home and be a, a you know a stay at home housemaker, or I can go out and get a job or do whatever the hell I want. That's what feminism means. Yeah, it's, it's what you want, not what you're being forced to do. Exactly. So someone comes up to me and says, that's not true feminism. True feminism is making sure that men are lower than us. That's not feminism. Go. Oh, not, not the one true, not, not, not the, not the no true Scotsman uh, argument. I hate that. You could go away now. Wow, Raniac, hating on the Scottish, are we? No, 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 no. <laughs> Do you know what no true Scotsman is? Uh, <laughs> I know what no true Scotsman is. I'm just fucking with Welsh, you. Now the Scots. What's next? The Irish? Oh, forget you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just take it as created that uh, the character of Ruth Ingram, not the worst character by far, no. not bad, just Still iffy. unfortunately written, considering, yeah. you know. She's very well little, it's, it's, you. I don't know if I want to say the worst. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a lot better than what I would say. She, she is a bit. She is very romantical because um, there's nothing wrong with making who's a, a feminist who's funding per se. their operation, Rainiac. Well, yeah, let's get to that. Yeah. So hmm. um, they are working under Professor Faskalos, and Professor Faskalos is, is uh, played by this little actor called Roger Delgado because it's totally the master in disguise. Never heard of him. My God. Oh yeah. Did Did you catch the uh, name thing? Because that comes up later. Yeah, and all I'll say is it's accurate. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We, well, you you can just say it because the doctor okay. says it. In yeah, part, the the but, other conceit of the man, Fascalos is great for master, and it really is great for master. Seventies mm-hmm. Doctor Who was not exactly subtle. So like hey, you learn something, kids. Well, technically, it was subtle because you don't know how many people actually researched into uh, Greek stuff, and there was no internet. It doesn't have to be subtle, though, because everyone at this point knows who Roger Delgado yeah. is playing. So. Oh, yeah, but, uh, you know, the reveal of his name would be interesting later. Yeah. And we, we're going to gush, spoiler alert, we're going to gush about Roger Delgado, I think, throughout so, this entire podcast. Roger Delgado is fine. He is just a terrific villain. He gets so many list, of the, the good moments. My favorite incarnation moments. of this character will always... My favorite incarnation of this character will always and forever be Michelle Gomez. But Roger Delgado started the whole thing. Yep. So, gotta give props. 
and he and he does get a big scene where he has to meet the uh, I, I don't know what this character is like chairman of something your professor this somebody the director of the Newton Institute yeah and he's basically Percival. yeah and he's pissed off he's just like this Tom Dit bullshit is it's just a crackpot theory what an absurd goddamn acronym you've chosen you're a hack fraud I say you know very stiffer. A stiff upper lip British guy. And so the master, the f- forced to uh, get reamed, is basically, uh, yeah, he has to do a little hypnotic stare, which the 70s master could do. Yeah. He gets to say the line I am the master, and you will you obey. You will obey me. And all the kids are like, <laughs> yeah! Here Ready, put that in. Put that in. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I had a different uh, Matt Groening cartoon in mind, but that was. <laughs> oh, did you have a Nickelodeon meme? No, I, I, I just did. I said, "Say the line, Master. I am the master, and you will obey me." Yay! <laughs> so, so he basically browbeats the director with hypnotic power to keep his uh, project. Until he need, he's obviously plotting something. Yeah. But meanwhile, our two scientists decide, oh, the hell with it. Let's do a trial run of the system. What's the worst that could happen? Well, you know, a lot of stuff. Yeah, and, and there's a bit of um, there's a bit of cleverness that Hyde does to um, to Ingram here, where uh, she doesn't want to run the experiment. Mm. And Hyde basically pushes on her, her feminist tenets and says, so... Well, in that case, you're, you're agreeing that a man should be in charge. Where's that experiment? Let me start it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So I, I don't know if he's supposed to be like, oh, this is why feminists are stupid because they're so easy to manipulate or whatever. But honestly, I kind of like him as a character. Stuart's a really I, 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 I like Stuart Hyde. He's... Stuart's all right, <laughs> yeah. He, he's got a childish sense of humor, which I quite like. He goes with the flow. Yeah. And the flow in this case is uh, the <laughs> shit goes wild with the experiment. We got Johnny Window Washer here going up to uh, watch the windows just as it's going. <laughs> and Johnny Window Washer takes a tumble. That's just the window washer. He comes in there and it's like 12 o'clock. But it's a few seconds before 12 o'clock. <laughs> ah! <laughs> but things go weird with the... Uh, trial run as they teleport like I don't even know what it is, a vase or something. They yeah, basically teleport uh, yes. this machine. Yeah. Yeah. They teleport it from they teleport it from the main room into their little side room. And the test is a success, but they uh get some troubling readings about the power levels and whatnot. Yeah. And of course and the, the master, being the master <laughs> is able to sense all this and comes running to berate them mm. and be like the hell are you doing? You, Meanwhile, back at UNHQ, the doctor has, uh... Now, it's Tom Tit, this thing. And the doctor has rigged up a, shall we say, unfortunately shaped device. <laughs> it looks like a penis. It, yeah. So this thing is a time sensor. It, it, it'll it sense uh, fluctuations. Now, the doctor intends to track the master's TARDIS with it. But he does a test run with his own TARDIS. And the, and the machine goes ding. And Joe is like, oh, good, it's working. He comes out, and after a few seconds, it goes ding again. And she's like, did you leave something on the TARDIS? This is coinciding with the time experiment up in Cambridge. So it's like, oh, oh, he's doing shit. Let's track it down. So he gets out a map, and he's plotting the coordinates. And they decide to go up to Cambridge. As you do. Indeed they do. And they're going to do it with the best character ever, Bessie. Oh, Bessie, this is so good. Uh, so, to to run through real quick, uh, the Master shows up after... <laughs> There's a cute bit where once they get the thing, uh, In- Dr. Ingram and Dr. Hyde are just de- jumping up and down going, we did it, we did it, we did it! And the Master busts in and he's like, what in the fuck did you two idiots they're, do? They're waltzing and they waltz right into him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And the Master I mean, bitches she- over. For yeah. a bit. We we learned, by the way, that they're actually they're actually brother and sister as well. Are, are they? I, there's a lot. Let me. I caught this line. I'm not sure if it was like a joke or not. Let me let me just 
I Sir. believe they are brother and sister, yes. Um, which best best question might have got different certain. I guess Ruth is married at this point, but um No, 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 I don't I don't know actually. It might be, might be, I'm I'm not sure. The TARDIS Wiki didn't say. So Yeah, well TARDIS Wiki's not exactly the greatest site in the world. Not yeah. really villainous. Not truly Especially villainous. Especially now I know now I know that it's got it's got some she was a questionable articles on there. Oh yeah, see <laughs> you. Oh, really... that. Yeah. yeah, there's some, there's some, there's been some bullshit. Anyway, uh, the master bitch is on, but Doctor Ingham is threatens to do something or to bring it up to the director or somebody, and he backs down. He's just like, yeah, okay, because he, he knows he doesn't want to kick up a fight with Doctor Ingham right as his plans about to go off. Plus, they show him the thing that happened with the machine, and he's like, oh. Oh yeah, this is actually really good that we learned about this. And the, yeah. the weirdest part is the master actually apologizes to them. I assume yeah. he up his, you know, his. He's keeping up appearances because it's yeah. not, you know, he's yeah. got to play the part until. And, his, and his apology actually infuriates Ruth because <laughs> she says something about I don't know which what annoys me more his infernal uh, what is it? Uh, where's the line? You can look that up. Yeah. Oh, here it is. I know what's more annoying, his dictatorial di- manner or that infernal courtesy of his. <laughs> I think that was closer to the beginning of the episode where we first saw yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's funny because uh, what, once he shows up later on with the director yeah. and he sees that some people have arrived. Oh, hey, uh, it's the minister. Oh, and Unit are also here. Oh, yeah. it's, it's really uh-oh. Funny because um, Ruth is, uh, is talking to them and, or talking to him and they look out the w- um, Stu's looking out the window and says oh look there's some people from unit here and the master's like uh hey Ruth do you want to go eat some pheasant for me yeah it's, it's well, he's, this is this is another smooth cover thing the master was supposed to have dinner with these uh, delegates about the stuff but once unit is there he's like oh shit uh, the brigadier will arrest me on the spot so he makes up this lie about how he's a pacifist and he's opposed to working with soldiers and smooth talks his way into getting Ruth to go out for dinner instead. That's the funniest thing because the master's definitely yeah. not a pacifist. We, we should oh. mention that. We, kind of, we kind of skipped over it. So uh, earlier at Unit HQ, the Brigadier mm-hmm. was going over to Cambridge because he'd been invited to see this Tom Tit uh, thing in action. And okay. the Doctor didn't want to come with him. Joe mm-hmm. didn't want to come with him because she wanted to stay with the Doctor. So poor old Sergeant Benton, who was about to go on leave, was roped into it instead. Poor guy. <laughs> and we should also talk about Bessie, the greatest, Bessie. the greatest car. Yeah. Now we get to the Bessie scene. So um, the, the doctor, doctor has to go to Cambridge with Joe in tow. And fast. Luckily, and fast. he has super drive. <laughs> <laughs> Better know to spin up footage. It's so good. Just like, <laughs> that part? What's that? There's a SpongeBob meme for that too. Oh no! Go ahead. Oh, I don't. I know what's coming. I know I what's know. coming. I don't know what's coming because I don't know that much SpongeBob. It's, it's got to be that one. It's got to be that one meme. But go on, find it. <laughs> yeah, I'm finding it. Just Show us the meme. <laughs> Roll that beautiful meme footage. I just want to see if I'm if I'm right. Well, well, while you're finding it, I'll just say that the way Tom Tit works is that apparently time is made up of little bits, temporal atoms, and what Tom Tit does is it pushes objects between the temporal atoms to push them outside of time and then shove them back into time, in and phase them is basically matter transportation, but through time. Which, yeah. I guess the practical application of this is like, like email, but for physical bullshit. You know, like, oh, you need a bunch of stuff shipped. We'll just tom tit it from the UK to Beijing or something in a second. Tom tit the original three D printing. <laughs> well, we're three D printing some amazing shit here. Once we get to the climax of the episode, but I'm waiting for the meme before I get oh my to that. God. Yeah, so I don't think the meme's coming. Find a, just a plain, unedited version of it. You're get a two-parter. I okay. know what it is. You'll never catch me, Krabs. No, it's not, no. it's not the one I thought it was. Never mind. Okay. 
I was expecting for it, but that's better. This is more fitting for later, but anyway, our part one cliffhanger is the master is activating the machine. And it's clever because he waltzes in to do his stuff. He's in a radiation suit and he says, oh, I'm in here because uh, Mr. Hyde may need me. So I'm just putting on my suit as a precaution. Yeah. Not so you can't see, not so unit can't see my face and arrest me on the spot. But, um... So, you know, they do, they do their little tests. The power increases. And it's like, hey, isn't this dangerous? Uh, professor, maybe you should wrap it up. And, and he just takes off his radiation helmet and the cliffhanger is him yelling. And you've no idea why he's yelling this yet as the episode ends right as he says it. He just yells, come, Kronos, come. Cue cliffhanger sting. He, he doesn't take his helmet off. Doesn't take his helmet off yet? I no. thought he did. Well, no, he just whatever. shouts, come, Kronos, come inside also, the full body. Uh, we should also mention <clears> that Stu was in the crystal room. And because of the yeah, there's a crystal. Yeah, there's a mag there's a little crystal powering Tom Tip. By the way, that'll become very important later. Yeah. yeah so oh, just like out the, you know that window washer that fell out of the off the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. He's alive. Yeah, yeah he's fine. He's fine. He's just badly injured, uh, but he's alive. Is, however, it's not okay because all the energy from the crystal affects him, and he passes out. And we'll see. And he'll happens. be pretty. It yeah. Too. Yeah. Well. Yeah. As the doctor and Joe arrive at Cambridge, the doctor goes to talk to Joe, but she's frozen in place. What the hell is going on? There's time shenanigans happening. But the doctor can still move in them, I guess, because he's time lordy. I, I guess that's the implication. Because the, doc the doctor and the master are the only ones who can move while Tom Tit is doing time shenanigans. So I'm assuming... wasn't affected by the time stone. I'm, ass <laughs> I'm assuming it's because they're time lords. I guess. That must be. That, that's probably the uh, reason, but we get the machine shut off, and the master gets away. As he does. And we go to find Stuart, and uh, uh-oh, he's old as fuck. He's 80 years old now. I also love the way the master just gets away, that he pretends he's been frozen in the suit. So the doctor's walked past him, but as soon as the doctor's gone by him, he just sneaks off. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Uh, but yeah, uh, so they, they study Stu, and you know they put around a couple of different theories, and then they realize, well, the only thing they could really do this to him is just aging naturally. So the doctor th figures out that obviously that means that his time has been, you know, accelerated to make him this age. By some, maybe by some sort of time monster. Yes. And we yeah. get that because Stu suddenly wakes up and starts yelling out, Kronos! <laughs> yep. <laughs> the Brig calls back to Unit HQ to get some anti-tank rockets. Oh, and the Doctor's Tart as well, we're at it. And some troops. Yeah. Why does he want an anti-tank rocket when there's no tanks? Because <laughs> it's the master. <laughs> Was this just like a standard procedure that the Brig always said, right, clear some kits off here, bring the anti-tank guns. So, hey, I'm, I'm jumping ahead from my... Do anti-tank guns? Because I never get to use anti-tank guns. If I had the chance, I would absolutely <laughs> call for the anti-tank guns. <laughs> I am, however, violently American. So, take <laughs> So, I'm jumping ahead a bit here. Feel free to catch anything I, I'm missing here. I'm just going by my notes, but... Uh... We get an explanation from the doctor about Kronos, and he mentions a species called Chronovores, yeah. which live outside time, and they eat life. With, and Kronos being a really particularly nasty and powerful one. And also connected to Poseidon and Atlantis in Greek <laughs> mythology. Hey, Rainiac, uh, mythology expert, how accurate is this? <laughs> Well, what they've actually done here is they've conflated two different um, mythological figures. Okay. So this Kronos is spelled with K-R, and that Kronos is the father of Zeus and all the other Olympian gods. But then there's Kronos C-H-R, which is the Greek personification of time. Okay. Kronos with a K ate a so they've conflated the, the two beings, I think. We should probably mention that. Interesting. Like a lot of his They're giving them traits from both. And of course, there's danger to the entire universe because of this. Yeah. Well, yes, because it's the Master. It's kind of what he does. Yeah. So, for a while here, both the Doctor and the Master are work 
are working on this problem independently. Hey, they're mirroring each other. Is that the Doctor Who mirror alert? Well, 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 I mean, there's a there's a bigger one. You kind of blown your load here because there's a much bigger one coming up later on. But uh... oh, there's 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 like three or four big ones. Uh, and keep in mind, I didn't pick this, so true. I I just got a column like I see it, but yeah. But they're both working out why Tom Tip went ape shit. I have been sitting on that pun for all weekend. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there was a pun there. Oh. Tom Tip went ape shit. I'm sorry, I, I thought puns were supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> and the doctor has I just missed it. I just missed it. the doctor had Sergeant Benton do a little experiment here, where they're in the room with the uh, shiny crystal that's powering Tom Tit, and he's like, "Just try to lift that thing up for me, will you?" And Benton tries to lift it. He can't do it. Is it heavy? Is it like super dense matter? Heavy as fuck? No, the answer is it's not actually here. It's just a projection, and the real crystal is 3,000 years in the past in ancient Atlantis. Sure. Yeah. So that's certainly an explanation. <laughs> Meanwhile, Joe has been left behind with a poor old stew to try and just... Uh, keep him comfy and relaxed. And he wakes up, you know, he's like, oh, where am I? What's happening? I feel so weird. He looks at his own hands, and he's like, oh, what's wrong with my hands? Give me a mirror! Give me a mirror! I'm, I'm not gonna do it again. <laughs> but no. It's a dramatic moment, but he looks at his face, and he's like, oh, no, I'm old as fuck! He, he doesn't take this very well. Sergeant Benton, meanwhile, has been set to guard the uh, lab. Which puts him squarely into the crosshairs of the master. Uh oh. Yeah, the master and the director. The master had to reapply the hypnosis, and he has a little witty comments like, "You're the most, you're the most susceptible hypnotic subject I've had in a while." God, you're weak, Will. But he does a little. He does a little can, trickery. Can I describe the trick because I love the trick. By the okay, way. okay, go ahead, go ahead. You do. It's it. not often that you get a really serious trick by the master, and I just love talking about them. So okay, what he go does ahead. Is he has um, the director call into the lab, and Benton picks up, and he Benton is told that the brigadier would like him to come meet him. Benton, of course, is just like, I don't believe you at all. So the director is like, what do we do? What do we do? The master says, tell him to call up the brigadier then. Here's the phone number. Have him call. So Benton calls, and the master is able to perfectly replicate the brigadier's voice. Tells him to get over there. And then here's where Benton is the smartest guy in the room. He doesn't believe shit. So he opens up a window leaves the room, locks the door, and then circles back around and goes through the window, pulls out his gun, and is ready and waiting for the master and the director when they come through the door. Yes. Fantastic. The, the mistake that the master makes is as the brigadier, he calls Benton old fellow. Yeah. And that's how Benton knows. Wait a minute, I'm My being dear put fellow. out. Yeah, dear fellow. Yeah. He, he says, you, you didn't come on as not in the habit of calling the sergeants, My dear fellow. I'm not about to fall for the oldest trick in the book. And, and then and the master. he falls off for the actual true, truest. Yeah, and he falls for the oldest trick in the book. The master's like, yeah. well, I guess you got me. Oh, <laughs> doctor, hello. Benton looks. The master just chops him. And he's like, that's the oldest trick in the book, Benton. I think he, I think he judo throws it by his wrist into, into a locker and yeah. knocks him out. Yeah, he does. Yeah. It's awesome. So at the end of part two here, we've, we've sped a lot. I've, I've sped a lot through. I'm just going by what I wrote down. Are the, imper yeah, are the important anything, bits. So it's, just like it's a six-parter. There's a lot of fat in these. Yeah. I, I don't mind you jumping through this. It's fine. So this episode two cliffhanger, we have a flashback to ancient Atlantis with a priest and a guy with just the strongest eyeshadow game I've ever seen. My God, this man. <laughs> just holy fuck. They, they like... Half the budget of the story must have been an eyeliner and eyeshadow, but we'll get to that when we get to Atlantis. We'll, we'll, we'll meet this chap um, officially later on, but um, but with ancient the priest, person with him that we're interested in here. Crystal Kronos is the yeah. It's the, we call it Crystal Kronos in Atlantis. It's glowing. There's thunderstorms and shit. He heads to it. 
And as the master activates Tom Tit again, it pulls the this Atlantean priest forward in time from ancient Atlantis to the seventies, and that's the end of part two. And this priest by the name is named Crisis. Crisis, yes. Crisis, whatever. So part I, three. I have a problem with some of the some of the uh, Greek names in this. They sound like they were trying to say other things. Yeah. So I I could have like sworn Crisis I heard Crisis as Clotis, but it is Crisis. I was thinking more like so, Crisis. So also, also um, when the when the uh, the master is turned to be the professor, his Greek accent keeps fluctuating. Interesting. And I can't tell if that's like just that he couldn't do a Greek accent convincingly, or give his Roger Delgado, who probably could, or it's a deliberate, um, it's deliberately been thrown in there to make to make people realize maybe he's not actually Greek. Interesting. You know, show that he's putting it on. He can't. He can't keep it on all the time. But um, so it would make part three. More sense as to how the king later on figured out that he wasn't on the up and up. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it was on purpose. So, so part three opens and uh, things get wild really fast. Oh, do they ever? So the high priest. So the high priest crosses shows up and the master's just like, "Hey, sup? Want to take over the universe?" <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. He's just like, sure. <laughs> he's, he's basically like, sure, and the master's looking for the key to control Kronos, and it turns out it was a seal that the high priest had here all along. Yeah, but interestingly, he's not actually a priest of Kronos, he's a priest of Poseidon. Mm -hmm. He worships Kronos, but he's not a priest of Kronos. Speaking of Kronos, it's finally time to get a look. Dude, it's... <laughs> Poor Stu can sense it, I guess, because he, he, you know, I, I guess he got a sense for it after getting his life sucked out. But Kronos is coming, motherfuckers. And, <laughs> well, I think, this, I think this is part of your theory, why, why this is the worst John Pertwee story. Someone who's a fan of Doctor Who, uh, quote-unquote, for the monsters, would look at this and think this is the dumbest shit imaginable. Us three idiots look at it and go, oh my god, this is the dumbest shit imaginable. I love, I it. love it! Yeah. <laughs> so there'll, there'll be an image of this thing on the screen, but Kronos is depicted as a giant white humanoid bird. A giant bird man just going, ah! 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 Laughing his wings. And the, the writer was not happy about how they, they, they did the effect for this thing. This is not how he envisaged it at all. He wants it to be all like majestic and mysterious, and no, it's just a guy flapping. <laughs> it's majestic and mysterious, it wouldn't have nearly as good an effect. Sometimes you just need. Do you guys want to know what? what's running through my head every single time this Kronos came up? What's that? Edge of 17. Edge of 17? The song, yeah. It's Stevie Nicks' song? Uh, oh, just like a white winged yeah. dove. Sing the song, sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep reference. Wow! <laughs> it took no, me a second. Yeah, Ro Robert. According to this, Robert Sloan was unimpressed with the realization of Kronos. He envisioned it as a shimmer and a vibration, but it was realized by a gnat flapping away on pulleys. Okay, but like, listen. Sometimes you want your Doctor Who to be just goofy Gonzo with shit. Like, I know, but we, all, we, all I can we, think of now, all I can think of now is how they 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 did the, they filmed the pterodactyl in Torchwood. Also, um. Uh, another funny thing that you people could do out there is, have either of you ever played Space Quest? I dabbled with it once ages ago. I believe I have not, no. Well, do you know of the Astro Chicken game? No. I don't remember that one. Also, no. <laughs> well, for those of you out there who know, and I'll link it to these guys later, try playing all the scenes of Kronos coming flapping down while playing the Astro Chicken theme. It, it is. Oh. Me, it's hilarious. I okay. You're gonna link me that, and I'm gonna fire the episodes back up and do it, and I'm gonna have a laugh. But yeah, uh, oh yeah, by the way, Kronos uh, eats the director. Just just flaps real just close to him. Just him, yeah. Just, uh, like there's not even the body. He's just like <laughs> gone. It just just deletes him from existence, like he was broken, Matt Hardy. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> he Thanos is that bitch. Yeah. Wonderful! Ah. So, as, as shit is happening, uh, the science, Dr. Ingram and uh, 
I, I think Benton and uh, the Brigadier. I'll try to go back into the lab. But as they get close, they slow. Yeah, they they get affected by the time energy and they slow right down. The Doctor has to go and retrieve them one at a time. I think it happens to Joe too. Um, doesn't say Joe here. No, because Joe's still with Stu. Okay, okay, Joe's still with Stu. Okay, I thought it happened to Joe. But... It's it's, Do- it's it's Ruth, Benton, and, and the Brig. And the Doctor, who, again, I remind you, can move at normal speed during the time shenanigans. He runs forward and pulls them back from the field before they get completely frozen in time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so the Master, meanwhile, he's got he's got a loose bird in the house here. And he, he's trying to use the seal from the priest to uh, scare Kronos off and prove that he can control it. Which... He, not really doing the best job, but, you know, he manages to at least get the genie back into the bottle here. And Kronos yeah, just he uses the seal, he needs his, um, what's his name? Priest crushes the seal to, to get him back, as you say, in the bottle. Actually, if I remember correctly, um, Stu and uh, Joe are actually in the car, or in a car at the time. because they're Okay, so Joe could be. So, near yeah, yeah they couldn't leave the car. Stu, um, Stu suddenly ages back to his normal age of 25. Oh, yeah. He does, yes. Do I have that down here? Yeah, he he um hmm. he returns back to his usual age. I, I've got in my notes. Wait, how the hell is he back to normal already? So I must have missed when that happened. But yeah, well, essentially the time field did timey wimey bullshit or something like that. Timey wimey bullshit. They they didn't want to put this guy in old man makeup for like the other two parts. So you know, there's... the writer's got to eat. Roger's got to eat. Stu's back to normal. I mean, good for him. I wouldn't mind these stuff. That's in that's that's why you have a scene where he, he has to rescue them one at a time because the writer's got to eat. We've got to pad out the runtime. Oh, yeah, it's a six part, man. And it doesn't have to be. No, no. But at this point, we we go sort of back in time again where we meet Lord Dalios, who is the leader of uh, Atlantis at the time, and he's speaking with um. I, I want to say he's a guard, Hippias. Hippias is not a guard, no. Hippias is one of his um, noblemen. Okay. Well, either way, he's and... there too. And they're talking about Kronos, and Hippias is asking if it's time for him to come back, and Dalios reveals that he's actually old enough to remember when Kronos was still around. Um, and to the point where he has the rest of the crystal, which... Essentially, the Master needs the rest of the crystal in order to be able to truly summon Kronos out of uh, the space where it currently is. So he hmm. has the he has the Kronos crystal secured back in the back, and it's being guarded by a terrible, horrible creature that we don't see. That, that but we hear it go, yes. so probably spooky. I, 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 I want to stress again, Hippias. His name is Hippias. Eyeshadow game strong. Yeah, very strong. Fuck. He's he's like God, like. I know it's the it's the seventies. It's the seventies. It's a it, there's a little glam rock going on there for sure. But well, not even that. It's it's still the mixture of being both Greek and Egyptian, where they have the, yeah. the very Egyptian coal around the eyes and you know like the yeah. hieroglyphs and murals on the walls. But then they mm-hmm. also act Greek. It, it's it's yeah. this weird sort of mixture of the two cultures that kind of. I guess that would make sense for the Atlantis myth. Yes. I guess it's, that might be what they're going for. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Doctor Who is engaging in some complete bullshit. But it's fun, complete bullshit. It is. Is this, it the, is. Is this, the, is this the Heath Robinson thing? The Heath Robinson thing? Yeah, when he makes that contraption. Yeah, the contraption, yes. Yeah. So yeah. the Master is about to do you some bullshit. You say bullshit, I say glorious. I love this. Yeah, I mean... Again, this is one of those things where you can see Fenn going, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. Yeah. This is stupid. When is a goddamn monster going to make Joe Grant scream? But, yeah. Uh, the, doc- the, the doctor wants to stop the master from traveling in his TARDIS to Atlantis. But he's uh, currently stuck in, uh, I, I guess it's Stuart's lodgings. I don't know if it's Stuart and Dr. Ingham's lodgings together, but... It's his place. So the doctor gathers up a bunch of shit, you know, an old wine bottle, a cork, some forks, some other bullshit, and it creates a big spinny thing. 
And it doesn't quite work, but... Oh, the missing ingredient was tea leaves. You see, the, 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 entire, the, the entire United Kingdom. But this bullshit he concocts with a wine bottle of some forks and tea leaves and a siren is some sort of makeshift time jammer. Yeah. Yeah. Just... There's, there's forks, there's a light, there's some keys, there's the corkscrew from the bottle of the wine. Says, uh, where he says that they used to build these all the time when they were back at school to mess with other people's time projects. <laughs> you, you, get, you guys remember that one children in need thing where the 10th doctor met the 5th doctor? Time crunch. And, yeah, and Tennant says, oh, you never needed a sonic screwdriver. You're like, I'm the doctor. I can save the universe with a kettle and string. <laughs> this, this is it. This is that! <laughs> they, they give some bullshit how it's like the shapes and the materials work together in order to do this, but you know it's bullshit. It's, it's, it's bullshit, it's but I love bullshit, it. But it's See, bullshit. someone call it bullshit, I would say he's being resourceful. Mm. I'm not saying no, it, that what it he works. does is bullshit, I'm saying that how he explains it is bullshit. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's it, dumb it bull- doesn't work very, very long, however, because no. uh, yeah. eventually uh, the master gets wind of what he's doing, and he's, he's like, that idiot, and... He overloads the time jammer, and the cup of tea falls off and breaks, and that's the end of that. Yeah. So, the master, meanwhile, uh, opens up his TV watch, <laughs> he has which, it, which hilariously is just ro- an sh- a, a insert shot of Roger Delgado's wrist, and they've got a little blue screen patch on it, and they just blue screen out the foot, they blue screen in the footage of, like, the unit convoy coming up. Yeah. And so the master's like, I'm about to ruin these guys' entire careers. As he oh, shit, them. I forgot to mention, by the way, this is the first time we've seen Mike Yates. Oh, it is. Hello, Mike Yates. You're, yeah, uh... Mike, Captain, Yates, Captain Mike Yates, who was a recurring character in the, in the Pertwee era, mm-hmm. he is leading the convoy, and this is just, as you say, he's about to ruin he's their entire to... careers because... So the Master decides to use his Tom Tit time power technology... To bring things from Cambridge's past to fuck with Unit and stuff. So first, he summons a goddamn knight on a horse with a lance, who immediately just tries to joust the convoy. (laughs) Who injured himself filming the scene. Poor guy. (laughs) Then we get roundheads with muskets and cannons firing at Unit. Yeah, know, there's, there's, were, a, there's a great uh, bit where Yates is, is trying to tell the Brigadier what's going on. He's like, have you been drinking, man? <laughs> <laughs> and just as Mike throws a grenade, uh, the, the guys vanish and just the grenade explodes in empty space. And it's just like, whoops. But the goddamn slime whistle that could be the grenade. I, Rain, I wrote him. Oh, I wrote my note. I, I wrote the wrong thing here, but... This isn't Man with the Golden Gun. What do you think? I wrote that. I wrote that. I'm the greatest slide whistle since Man with the Golden Gun. I wrote Live and Let Die by mistake. I was one movie off. No, and... it's, 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 not, it's not as good it's as Man with the Golden Gun. Whistle. That is hilarious. <laughs> God. <laughs> speaking, speaking of amazing car stunts, there's a wonderful scene here where uh, the, the Brigadier and the Doctor and Joe are going to go... Uh, rendezvous with Mike and co to figure out what's going on. And the brig gets in the street and he's like, okay, doctor, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll see you there. Don't go too fast and old Bessie. <laughs> and he goes off and the doctor, the smug guy, he just activates the super drive and Boom! Yeah. <laughs> all, all I could think of was that on your left scene from the Avengers movies. <laughs> <laughs> from the uh, Winter Soldier, yeah. yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the end of part three is the master's finale here, which is a World War II bomber. Yep. That it's a coincidentally, fucking doodle bug. Doodle it's a V1. Bug. That coincidentally dropped a bomb during the war right here in Cambridge. So he just brings that back from time and it drops the bomb and the cliffhanger is the Brigadier calling up Mike. I don't think like, he brings the plane. I think he just brings the bomb. I think he just brings no, the rocket. Uh, no, he, oh, he well, brought the plane because this is... He brought the plane the because they hear it. Where they can hear the engine of the doodle bug going above them and um, they comment that as soon as they hear that engine cut out, that means they're going to drop the bomb. So we need to get in contact the, the, with it. The doodle bug wasn't a plane. The doodle bug's the rocket. Yeah. Well, whatever. It's a, it's a V1. Whatever. Yeah, it is. V1, V1 rocket. They're going to drop on the unit troops. 
Yeah, I'm yeah so the cliffhanger is... Uh... As soon as the plane engine cuts out, that means that they're dropping the bomb. So they're trying to get in contact with Yates or, well, Mike. But the radio contact is bad, and it's just like, Yates, report, Yates, report. Can't hey, you bring it there. And then the bomb goes off, and it's like, oh, no, Captain yeah. Yates has been blown up. Cliffhanger like, music. Get out of there, man. It's a bomb. Off, it's a bomb. It's, just, oh, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful cliffhanger, because as soon as the bomb cuts, or as soon as the um, engine cuts off, you hear the Brigadier going, Yates, it's a bomb. Get out of there. Get out of there. And then you hear uh, Yates like, okay, man, let's go. And then boom. Boom. Yeah, they, they frame it really well. Unfortunately, the resolution to that great cliffhanger is rubbish. Yep. That's, oh. <clears throat> Just they survived. That's it. Lives. <laughs> no, we're not it's kind of it's kind of like a Looney Tunes. Guy and, blew, and blew them up, but they're alive. They're injured, it's, but they're alive. It's kind of like a Looney Tunes thing. You got Mike Yates looking like Wiley e. Coyote after a fuck up. <laughs> it's no sense, but it's uh, it's okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> Hang on, hang on. I've I've got a I've got a meme for that. Oh God. <laughs> hang on. <clears throat> where 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 is the image? Okay, there's em there's empty. Oh, there it is. This 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 works. I um. Cliffhanger resolution to part four of the time monster. I'm dreading this already. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Makes no damn sense. Compels me though. Yeah. Fair, so fair we've also right. got we've also got a uh, the the part we are I love this a uh, comedy uh, country guy. We got Mr. Farmer here going. Oh wow, that's weird. That sounded just like that dude bug what fell in forty four. Yeah, the exact spot. Yeah. Local you know. country bumpkin. They loved the the part we are loved its country bumpkins. Spearhead from space, looking... the Claws of Access, the Three Doctors, this. He's, he's credited as farm worker, so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Mr. Farmer, uh, the, yeah, the, so the, the uh, bomb uh, knocked the Doctor's TARDIS, which the combo was carrying off, off of the truck uh, and on the side. But luckily, Mr. Farmer has his tractor to haul it up. Yeah, Meanwhile, it's, it's, it's strange to see the TARDIS not used as a vehicle, but just as a tool in yeah. the first re era. Well, they do technically kind of use it as a vehicle here, but they basically later on. Yeah. yeah. The doctor can't really control it, but they, the writers have found a way around that to excuse the trip we're about to take. But meanwhile, uh, the scientists in Benton have an idea. Yeah, Let's they, they, they fooled the team to nobble the master. <laughs> Let's go get that motherfucker. Mr. Krabs, I have an idea. <laughs> oh, God. I'm not kidding. There's a SpongeBob meme for everything. Uh, I believe you. Why does everything you. come back to SpongeBob? Why does everything come back to SpongeBob? <laughs> okay, but does, do we have a SpongeBob meme for our discussion of uh, another element of the story that I guess is criticized for some reason? Uh, the new round things? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all... um. We get a look in the Master's TARDIS. Which is the same goddamn set. Yeah, it absolutely is the same set. But uh, the, the, it's disguised. The TARDIS is disguised as a computer terminal. It's like a 70s computer terminal. So like in the lab. Data, data tape and shit. But... So big, clunky, tapes, whirring, yeah. whirring dials, that sort of thing. But that's his TARDIS. Because the whole thing about the Master is that the Doctor's TARDIS was stuck <laughs> as the police box. <laughs> The Masters wasn't. What is she late? <laughs> oh, Jesus. It's fudge about me for everything. But, I was, yeah. I was, I was getting into full flow there. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. New round things. Yeah. The, New the, round the Masters, things. one of the, the Masters' adventures over the Doctor is his TARDIS can actually disguise itself as stuff. Yeah. Because he didn't get the, the chameleon circuit stuck and throw the throw the it's such a into a black hole. Yeah. So, uh, those round things. But the round things, yeah. So, um, as you say, the Doctor's TARDIS and the Master's TARDIS look exactly the same thing interior-wise. So we've got the Master and Crossis in his TARDIS, and we've got the Doctor and Joe inside his now. And the Doctor's plan 
is bonkers. The doctor's plan is bonk, literally. Yeah. He is going to materialize his TARDIS inside the Masters somehow. Despite yeah. the fact this is a really bad idea. Also, the doctor, Joe actually does comment on the new round things. And the doctor says he did explicit redecoration, which doesn't explain why the master also did this, has this coincidental thing, other than the real ordinance and of, fuck you, we're not building two TARDIS sets, we don't have enough money to fuck around. Yeah. But the, the, irony of that, the irony of that will become clear uh, a bit later yes. on. But, um... Yes. The very next story. Oh, shit. Hey. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 I did some redecoration line. That suddenly pays off that line in The Three Doctors. You Which is the very next story like after it. this. Wow. Yeah. So that's Hot why um, they say that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the Doctor's idea here is much like how you come in and remember the Daleks when the Doctor fucks with the transmat, where one half of the Dalek materializes with the other half of the Dalek. Yeah. So that's the danger of the Doctor's plan here at time, Ram, is that one TARDIS would occupy where the other TARDIS is, and, you know, boom, bad, woomph. Yes. And the cat, I believe there was something that you wanted to mention about this scene. <laughs> you mentioned it to me, anyway. That was several days ago. Give me a second. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll... I'll just. There you go. Just, 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 just. Oh, I don't yes. know what you're talking about. Yes. So this was a oh, surprise yes. to me because I didn't know about this. So in this, Joe and the Doctor are talking about the TARDIS, and the Doctor happens to mention a little thing that makes Joe go, "What do you mean?" And what he mentions is that uh, the TARDIS is a she and seems to be thinking. So Joe says, you're talking to it as almost as if it's alive. And the doctor says, yes, the TARDIS is alive. So fuck you, Chibnall. <laughs> Everyone, please cross out dunking on the Chibnall era on your bingo card. We don't have bingo cards for these now. Yell at Chibnall for murdering a TARDIS. He sure did. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> yeah. So, so long and short of it is the doctor. He, he he normally can't steer the TARDIS, but because he's in exile and the knowledge is literally been scrubbed from his brain, but uh, he's been using the time sensor thing to sort of home in on the master's TARDIS for this plan. But he does it slightly yeah. wrong. And instead of him materializing inside the Master's TARDIS, he gets inside the Master's TARDIS. Or the Master's TARDIS gets inside him. Either way, yeah, he, the, he does the, the opposite. Master's TARDIS inside, inside of his instead of the other way around. It's said not quite, because something a bit screwy happens. Well, you know what this reminds me of? So Sad. have oh, you no. guys ever taken a mirror and then put it oh! in another mirror and looked inside of it? Yeah! <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. My God! <laughs> I think that calls for... Doctor Who Mirror Alert! Whoop, 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 whoop. And I didn't you. even do it. And I didn't even do it this time. I didn't even think of it this time. So, it's the cereal what do you mean? that just keeps on giving. Isn't it just... And it's not even the biggest Doctor Who Mirror Alert in the story. But we'll get oh, to that later. Yeah. We're getting to that. We're getting to that. But, uh, yeah... Uh, the master isn't in his TARDIS right now, but he sees that unit is re is like finally recovered and ready to storm the building. So he switches on the Tom tit to uh, to freeze time. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll make the joke. I don't know if it'll go over your heads, but Zawaldo Toki wo Tomare. <laughs> no, it didn't go over my head. <laughs> I, I was thinking more, uh, Mr. Freeze. Chill out. <laughs> Damn also you, works. Ronnie James Dio. <laughs> Goddamn holy diver on the Famicom. Hardest fucking game ever. Anyway, uh, the master... <laughs> the master does... Yeah, the master uh, does this fuckery and uh, hops into his TARDIS and takes off with the Doctor's TARDIS inside his. Except and that, not. Except not. Except also. Yes, I don't. Yeah, they're I actually know. inside each other. 
somehow. Thanks. Bitch. Um, this okay, is... uh, Rainiac, we're going to need to talk afterwards. When you talk about the Master and the Doctor, you can't say they're inside of each other. The TARDIS is, not them. I know, but you still need to watch your wording. Mm. Okay. Because the fans there's, are there's like, a, there's the a lot of this is, not the two Time Lords, are inside one another. Okay, Rainiac, we're we still going to need to talk because you need to learn about rules. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just here. I'm just hearing careless whisper by George Michael in my head. <laughs> I was about to say I thought I clarified it, but clearly not. <laughs> no, no, sad sadly not. When it comes to the internet, just just stay away from it. <laughs> so can we talk about a, a, fun, a funny line that's delivered here? Uh, so the Doctor's TARDIS is bumping all around due to the turbulence, and Joe falls down and uh, bruises her tailbone, and the Doctor says something along the lines of, sorry about your... Uh, your cock someone say coccyx. I'm yes. sorry about your cock sex. Which, and the, the and, Greek... which is the actual technical term for the tailbone. For the tailbone. Yeah. yeah. And then and the master fact, shows I've, I've, I've bruised mine. I've bruised my tailbone in real life. It's painful. It's not painful. Ow. Yeah. I haven't, luckily. But then the, the, then the master shows up on the view screen, and Roger Delgado gets to deliver the line, Sorry about your cock sex too, Miss Grant. <laughs> Delgado's master is a is a shit heel, and the world is better for it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's dual subplots sort of happening here now. We got the Doctor and Master in their TARDISes, while uh, Doctor Ingram, Stuart, and Benton fuck around with the Tom Tom Tip machine. Yeah, so they're, they're trapped inside the lab at this point. Yeah, I, I guess we can talk about what they do since it's the, sort of the B plot. Oh God. But, but they uh, they see that the brig and friends are frozen, so they decide, oh, well, we'll turn off this machine. That'll fix them. They turn it off. Oh, they're still stuck in time. Oh, that's not good. So Dr. Ingram is doing some quick rewiring to try and figure out, you know, just try and get into the guts of the machine and figure out what the fuck's going on. So they they fuck around with their little janky time machine. And as they're about to run a little test and try to do it again, Benton's hand is resting on the little receptacle where they beam shit out, where smart. where they affect time. Super smart, Benton. Because guess Su what? Super now you're a baby. Congrats. Yeah, he gets <laughs> he gets aged back. So the same thing that happens to Stuart happens to him, only backwards. Instead of being aged forward in time, he's aged backwards, and now he's a baby. Yep. A very cute baby. Great. Right yeah, well, here's, here's the thing: the, the Benton subplot goes no, doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah, this is like the last. Just for just for the the gag at the end, really. Yeah. The rest is gonna wait. Yeah, this is the, this is actually the last we see of contemporary Earth until the finale. Because you know True. the way the way they structure this is it's four parts of science. Thankfully, malarkey. we do get an absolutely wonderful confrontation between uh, John Pertz <laughs> and Roger Delgado and their respective Tardises. So, at first, the the, the Master puts the doctor on mute as he's trying to tell him that Kronos is going to destroy the universe if he lets him out, blah, 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 blah. And then the, ma and then the doctor's, like, hacking some bullshit so that the master has to listen and can't put him on mute. But the master then does some horse shit involving sending the doctor's words back in time so that <laughs> the doctor appears to be talking backwards. <laughs> so you just get John Perfrey talking backwards, and the master's like, oh, I'm sorry, doctor, what was that? I couldn't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's actually quite funny because it's like... so with no choice left, the doctor has to go into the master's tardis to try and talk him down. Yeah, which she he's unsuccessful at because she knows it, it'll get him killed. Yeah, surprise, surprise! The master doesn't believe him. Immediately summons Kronos. Ka ka, motherfuckers! The doctor gets eaten. Yep. And the, the and the master's gloating, and Joe is sad, and this is actually a very almost sort of noble thing. Shows how much Joe cares about the doctor. She's just like, oh, I don't care what you do to me. You've destroyed the doctor. And the master's just like, well, what should I do with you? You're an embarrassment. Ah, just get it over with quickly. Your word is my command. Goodbye, Miss Grant. And he sends the yeah. TARDIS hurtling off into the vortex. And that's where we I, end part four. I love how efficiently he does this. Mm -hmm. He's just reveling in playing this character, isn't he? You can just tell. He is.
part five then begins with Roger Delgado's incredible evil laughter. <laughs> and of course. As he dumped cliff. the TARDIS out of his own TARDIS to just leave it spinning in space. Now, the Doctor is not actually dead at this point, but as dead. the Master calls it, it's a living death. He is stranded inside the time vortex. Which is bad. Yeah, I presume but... this is where poor old Dr. Percival is too, but he's not coming back. Spoiler alert. <laughs> or, uh, yeah. And I'll he's see gone. also... See also Salamander from the second Doctor story, The Enemy of the World. Oh, yes, he's he's super gone. Unless you count the comics, but well, we're not going to get We don't. So he, he, fell, he fell out. He's not surviving that. <laughs> so Joe is stuck in the TARDIS in the void, and she starts to hear the whispering of the Doctor. And he's talking to her. And the whispering is... He's actually using the telepathic circuits of the TARDIS to... Hello? What? what? Oh, no. no yeah. Another, another meme? Is this a SpongeBob meme? Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I just hell? noticed. I just noticed the very tiny Squidward. Oh, it's Squidward! God damn it. <laughs> okay. So the Doctor is talking to Joe through the telepathic circuits of the TARDIS. But there's also this whispering, which he, he just says is his subconscious thoughts. Don't pay attention to them. They're they're not really my better moments. But uh, he instructs Joe to push a big red button, pull a lever here, and that manages to materialize him inside the TARDIS and save him. Yeah. Also, Great. Cat points, to something, point, uh, Cat points out something interesting to me about the voices, or one of the voices. Yeah. Uh -huh. It turns out one of the voices is female. Oh, I didn't notice this. Yeah, meaning that the idea of there being a female doctor has pretty much always been there since here. Joe Martin confirmed. <laughs> yeah. So, parts five and six, you wanted your Atlantis. You got it. That's where part five and six are set, because uh, yeah. we, we get the Atlantean horns. We're here. Yay! We go full on Anthony and Cleopatra here. I know it's supposed yeah. to be Greece, but this is more Egyptian. Yeah. Okay, it, it's, 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 a, it's a mixture. Let's, let's, let's put it like that. Yeah. So... We get a scene of, you know, a council of the High Council of Atlantis addressing the king. We've got King Dalios and Hip, the, the Eyeshadow Man. Yeah, we, we've got a queen played by Ingrid Pitt. Oh, yeah, Galea. Oh, she comes. Doctor Who fans will know, will know exactly about Ingrid Pitt and Doctor Who, but I, I digress that story for another time. <laughs> Wait, what, what about Ingrid Pitt and Doctor Who? Oh, come on. She turns up in a, in a fifth Doctor story. Oh, wait. Oh! Oh! Yeah, the Fifth Doctor story. Oh, God! That, that's her? You got the show cancelled, possibly. That's her? Oh! Oh, my God. That's Doctor Solo. Yeah, that's... that's Okay. So, right. I shot a man basically calls out the king for uh, some... It, it, it's basically costume drama at this point, you know. <laughs> it's funny, this. We should call it Idalios, but... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Hippie, Hippie says he's going to speak plain to the king. He says, yes, you may speak plain. And then he says, it says that's plain speaking indeed. He clearly doesn't like it. He just, he just said he could speak plainly. You know, have a care indeed. Oh, I'm the king of Atlantis. Oh, God damn it, you, your highness. I, I will say one thing that I kind of wish they did is, uh, how do you pronounce the queen's name? Galia? 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 No, no, no. Um, the, the king. The queen. The queen. The queen is, is Gallia, I, which I almost heard as Gallagher. I kind of wish they did the like same thing and named her Pacife. Oh, wow. I, I honestly, Rainy when, when, when she first introduced herself to the master, I, I did hear Gallagher. <laughs> Gallagher. No, I, I wanted her to be named Pacife because that would have worked. <laughs> Rainy, I get it. You wanna, Rainy, I get it. You want to, you want to, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to enlighten us? I don't, so, I don't know. Queen passed it back. So we're going to learn later on what the monster is, and I will tell you once we learn what the monster is, okay? Okay, okay, okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. That's, that, that's your teaser. Queen passed it back. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And we so, better hurry because Rainick is going to die. <laughs> the argument basically is that Hippa Eyeshadow Man, I can't say, I can't say his fucking Hippius. name. Hippias. 
Hippias. The, he basically wants the great and powerful Kronos to return and bring prosperity to Atlantis. And King Darius was like, actually, that's a terrible idea. Kronos is uh, nasty. You don't want him to come back. Yeah. Yeah. That would, it would be a very bad idea if Kronos comes back. Pretty and then the master shows up and it's like, hi, I'm here to bring Kronos back. <laughs> <laughs> you know the yeah, terrible so- thing you were talking about? I'm here to, to provide that terrible thing. Yeah, so he basically he's got the high priest in the TARDIS with him, of course. And that, Hi, I'm Troy McCall. You ever been such a disaster? He materializes his TARDIS, which is he doesn't it doesn't bother to disguise itself. I guess they didn't bother to make it like a, an Atlantean pillar yeah, or whatever. It still looks like a seventies computer. It's still a seventies computer, but he comes out and it's just like, Hello, I'm an emissary of the gods, I'm here to bring back Kronos. And Queen Gal- Galia here, uh, wow, Cat Cat is super interested in the master. She, uh, as Cat said to me, she said it before I got to the episodes proper. She said, "Holy shit, the Queen is thirsty as fuck for the master." Yeah, she she. Uh... I, and I get to the episodes, and I'm, the like, from Roger and I'm like, "Holy shit, Cat, you're right. This Queen is thirsty." For the master, she she also has a cat for some reason, <laughs> and so a plot is hatched between the thirsty queen and the master. What's interesting is that the the king just is not taking the master's shit, as you alluded to earlier. Yeah, yeah, he he isn't. It, it, he even rebuffs the hypnotism gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> Like he says, look in my eyes, you will obey me, obey me. And he just laughs at his face and says, I'm too old to fall for that trick. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> is, that the first... is that the first time that that's failed to work? Uh, might be, I'm not sure. Was it a thing that it always worked up to that point or not? I think it was pretty consistent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if it always worked, then the master would be using it all the goddamn time. So I it, what's funny is that the next story, which is uh, Roger Delgado's last, and not by choice, sadly. Oh. Uh, yeah. in, that sto- in that story, for context, in the, uh, the first story, Terror of the Autons, which was the introduction of Joe and the master, the master did it on Joe. And then in, this, in that story, uh, he tries it again, and Joe is able to fight back. Oh. Yeah. So, look at the character growth. Character- I, I would say that you you could explain that that maybe she has some sort of training at unit after the first incident. Well, yeah, they 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 do say that it's like, oh, they told me what to do, and, and she just thinks some nonsense to get them out of her head. We know we know that Torchwood personnel were trained to resist psychic paper, yeah. mm-hmm. so it could be that they they unit personnel were trained to to resist hypnotism by the master. But um, while this plotting is going on, then the doctor has arrived and gets immediately with captured. Joe. And it's immediately arrested, yes. And uh, we should say that there's a scene with Queen Atlantis in her uh, chambers with her uh, servant girl, I guess. And uh, she's got a mirror, so let's hit the button. No. <laughs> I can do if, it myself. If I can get you to save the button for, for the next part. Save okay, we'll save the button for the next time. Us. Something happens, and Hippo manages to save them from the guards. Hippo and man. starts ta- to take them towards the king, and they happen to cross paths with the master who's being taken away. The well, master's well, just like... <laughs> yeah, Crassus realizes that there are threats to the master. So he gets the, he wants to have them executed. Hippias manages to stop him in time. Yeah. So instead, they're, they're taken to have an audience with Dalius. Uh, there's a great bit where um, Joe is introduced to, to the, um, the Atlanteans. As Joe, Joe Grant, they say, Welcome, Lady Jojo Grant. <laughs> <laughs> late, as in the late Tenth Arthur's end. She, she's, um, she's. Bri- <clears throat> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> she's briefly mistaken for a goddess. Yeah. But then she's, she's, she's just downgraded to a lady. But, um,. Yeah, you've you've uh, you've touched on it. The master and the doctor meet each other, having the master's been turned away by Delios, and the doctor has been summoned by Delios to to uh, have a conversation. So the guy that walks out in his face, it's just like, what the fuck? 
How are you still alive? The doctor's just like, disappointed. <laughs> According to this, he says, good afternoon. Now, where have I seen that face before? Yes. Beautiful. So... I, I uh, do love their interplay together. While like the doctor time, so. and Dalios have uh, parlay, uh, the Atlanteans take Joe to go hang out with the queen and give her an Atlantean makeover, which she finds groovy. Yes. It, it was 1972. Joe yeah. Grant, you can win Atlantis' yeah. next top model. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, the master is meeting with King, the Queen Gallia. So Joe Gallia, decides Gallia, to, Gallia, yeah. yeah, so Joe decides to eavesdrop, and the master is actually trying to sweet talk instead of hypnosis. So I guess he figures I guess he figures he can sweet talk the lady because he well, yeah, knows because that he she's immediately into. realizes, oh shit, this bitch is thirsty as fuck for me. This, yeah. this version of the monster had two major weapons. Hypnotism and charm. Yeah. And well, he's laying on the charm. He's convinced him he manages to convince her to get the true crystal so they can summon Kronos and you know. So they can rule together and oh King Dalios, he'll be fine, he'll be taken care of. But the crystal's guarded by a terrible okay, beast. So story time kids. Um and Rainiac helped me figure out the correct pronunciation of his name. <laughs> Which is okay. Pacife. So the story is that there was the king Minos, who oh. he was um, besieged by Poseidon to make a sacrifice to him. So Poseidon took this beautiful white bull and gave it to Minos. And Minos is like, "Oh shit, this bull is fucking awesome. I don't want to <laughs> get rid of it." Um. Let's sacrifice a different bull to Poseidon and keep this dank ass bull. So mm -hmm. they do that, and Poseidon's like, um, bitch, I'm the one who gave you the bull. Do you think I can't fucking tell? <laughs> he decides that the only I the only thing he could possibly do is go to Pasiphae and be like, you know what, Pasiphae? You are now thirsty. Thirsty as fuck for that bull dick. <laughs> Oh my god! The passive yeah. is like, oh man, the bull, fuck that bull is awesome. I need, I need that bull now. And passive is like, well, shit, I'm a human though. The bull won't want to fuck me. So she goes to like the local carpenter or whoever and says, look, don't ask questions. I need you to make me a big old ass cow statue with holes in very suspicious places. <laughs> So this is true. Gets, gets her gets her ass inside this bull or inside the cow, and then the bull gets inside of her. And then nine months later, she gives birth to the monster that is present in the story. The Ra bull. Rainiac, can can you flash during that entire monologue? This is actual mythology. Yeah. <laughs> this is the actual story of the Minotaur. Can I do flashing text in Sony Vegas? I think I can. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, don't, don't flash it too fast. Think of people with the photos. Oh, I can, because I've, I've done that before when, when, when we, we, we played the 1812 Overture. I'm thinking of that one South Park bit where they explain the Scientology, and they just have, this is what Scientologists actually believe on the screen. See, I'm thinking of the UK of French actual full kids dialogue. <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, this that would name story of the Minotaur. I that's the actual mention. story how the Minotaur came to. <laughs> I, I'm it's not up on my mythology, but <laughs> wild. The Greeks were thirsty as hell. I fucking so... love this story. Not not for the you know the bull fucking, but just for, for how fucking wild it is. The gods would have sex with anything, and would make other people have sex with anything. It was freaky as hell. Now, now, see, Cat was thinking of Stevie Nicks. Now I'm thinking of Kate Bush. I fell in love with a swan. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny you should mention that because that's another bit. Yeah, that's what Zeus did. Yeah, I know, Zeus, I know. That's Zeus what I was going for. A swamp. That's what I was going for. And uh, <laughs> it is a beautiful day, and you're a horrible swan. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh God. So yeah, uh, ancient the, Greek goose cake. So, so with oh that gosh. amazing, so with that amazing knowledge that I hope to God some child in 1972 curious about mythology found in a book in the library. <laughs> <laughs>
we learn the fact that the, the true crystal of Kronos, the thing the Master needs, is guarded by a terrible beast. Half man, half bull. That'll be, it'll be tough to get past. Oh, send Eyeshadow Man to get killed and clear the way. Yeah. So it's Joe so here... If you go in and you're not Delia, so send Hippias. But Joe mm -hmm. overhears this with, with... Now, the Queen's got a handmaiden mm -hmm. whose name is Lachis, played by Susan Penhaligon. And Lachis just happens to fancy Hippias. Uh oh, so, SpaghettiOs. So, so they go to warn the king. So you know he's not going to survive. Yeah. So they go to warn the king. Guards won't let him in. Joey decides oh, there's no time. I'm going to follow them. When you get in, warn them. So she follows so there's them. A great, there's a great line where she says, "The guys, the matter of life and death. Indeed, it is yours." <laughs> Jesus. The guards are very stupid in this in this last two parts. Yeah. So Joe follows so Joe follows Crassus and Hippias down into the down into the lair of the Minotaur. But uh Crassus fucking shoves Joe in through the gate and locks it behind her. Yeah, so Hippias I'm, goes through willingly, because he's been convinced that he has to go and get the crystal to, to save Atlantis. Joe tries to stop him. Crescent just grabs her and throws her into the room and locks the door behind him, as you say. And we end on... We don't end on a monster shot, actually. We end on just loud noises. It's, oh, shit, the Minotaur's coming. We end on a zoom-in of, of yeah. Joe looking terrified. And we see what she was looking at in part six, and... Just... Bless. She was looking at Dave Prowse. Yeah, I was going to mention this. Last time, we have remembrance of the Daleks. We had Michael Sheard, who was in Empire Strikes Back as Admiral Ozzel choked to death, and now we've done it again. We have the guy who did that choking. We have yeah, Dave we have, Prowse, who is the Prowse actual still, guy in the Dark Vader. We, we just lost Dave Prowse as well, so... Uh, yeah. Rip in peace, Dave Prowse. Or a piece of a real one, but um, he was also one. nearly Jules. He almost got the part of Jules. Oh, that would have been wild. He would have fit, because he was a monster. He was a mountain of a man. He was tall as fuck, yeah. He was huge, yeah. But yeah, okay. But here he is, uh, with a big bull head on him. <laughs> Look, it just is this another reason why you think people don't like the story? It could they, because it's so goofy. But awesome. can I just touch on on their their version of the Minotaur, Doctor Who's uh, variation of the myth? Uh -huh. So Delius in part five talks a little bit about this Minotaur. Um, the the Minotaur is, is named the Guardian, presumably for copyright reasons. And the Guardian is the same age as Delius. Ooh. He too is 500 years old. Brother? Over 500 years old. Because Delius is 537 years old at this point. Right. Uh, and he has been cursed to forever watch over the crystal. And the crystal goes, Delius theorizes that the, the monster will finally die. And he actually feels sorry for him. He doesn't see him as an enemy. He doesn't see him as a, as a, as a terrible beast. He sees him as a, like him himself. A very cursed old person. Yeah. So we have a poor cursed, uh, n totally not Minotaur for copyright. Can you? You can't copyright a myth. No, you can't. But they, and I think they do. They do name his Minotaur in the credits. So why they call him the Guardian? I have no idea. But Probably to, to hype up what it is to keep it a mystery. So they just say Minotaur, you're just going to Oh, know. come on. It's ancient Greece. It's locked in a maze. Of course it's the goddamn Minotaur. So, uh, the the serving girl, Lachis, uh, warns the doctor at the pop, top of part six. He uh, rushes down there, pulls out some action moves. Hippias is also here. And uh, some, some wild shit happens. Yeah. Right now. First off... Uh, to be killed. Yeah. Joe's about but, to kill by the by the Minotaur. But Hippias distracts. Yeah. Oh, he distracts all right. He distracts by getting treated like a jobber. Yeah. This this is just some this is some WWE shit right here. Yeah, the Minotaur fights Hippias. <laughs> by the, God! By God! The Minotaur beats Hippias by two falls of the submission, <laughs> picks him up in a military press. And, can I say it? Can I say uh, it? Can, uh, should, can I, can, would you like to or should I? Well, I, I love this bit, but it, it's really your... Go on. He kills he picks, him by... Throwing him through a goddamn mirror. Yep. <laughs> Hit it! Doctor Who mirror alert. 
This is a mirror whoop, whoop. that I'm, I am more than happy to have in this because it's amazing. And lest you think that the scene has ended in what <laughs> here has peaked here, the doctor then takes off his cape, which is a helpful velvet, and starts fucking acting like a matador against yeah. Minotaur. <laughs> he even says Toro, yeah. <laughs> And he uses his cape like a bullfighter to rile up the Minotaur, and the Minotaur fucking Kool-Aid mans his ass right through a wall. <laughs> Which happens to lead to where the crystal is. How lucky. God, what, this, this is just... Was it just <laughs> me, but when he actually crashed through the wall, did anyone else have the Zelda theme? Playing the head. I just, like... Y'all, okay, I, I get, I kind of get on some levels, looking at the Minotaur design and thinking, oh, that's crap, oh, shitty Doctor Who effect. But I I'm, I honestly cannot fathom how you can watch this scene and not be laughing with the episode. I, I may it, have to make that into an edit on Twitter sometime this week. It's just, it's fucking glorious and dumb in all the right ways, and I love it. Yeah. Another option it is. would be uh, having the Minotaur shout, I'm the Juggernaut bitch, before going to the... <laughs> God. Okay. Uh, I think it's safe to use the Zelda sound effect. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. So, long story short, we found the crystal. Oh no, we've been captured again. Yeah. Um, Krasis... Crosses had the key to the maze, and the doctor got it off him earlier by uh, choking him and a guard out with, with the guard's own uh, spear or trident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he didn't do a very good job of it because Crosses recovers to have the doctor arrested again. Yep. And the master and this time, is also the king Dallas of Atlantis. Is no longer the king. Yep. The master's the king of Atlantis. Whoa. So yeah, this, Hippias this is dead. A little coup while the, while they were in there with the Minotaur, you know. Nobody wants to see the coup happen. Yeah. Hippias is dead at this point because he says it in dialogue, but Hippias died going through that mirror because, of course, he did. He got military pressed by a goddamn half man, half bull. Yeah. <laughs> like you do when you get thrown it's, through a mirror. It's still real to him, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And so... uh, the Minotaur is either dead or, or uh, incapacitated as well. So they're in, they're in their prison. Uh, and Delius is uh, thrown into the prison with them because like, we demand to see the king. Oh, you'll see the king, all right. And the king gets thrown in. And one and of the he... guards <laughs> is a goddamn dick yeah. and hits the king in the face with his spear. And this eventually. And the king kills, kills him. him. Yep. Yeah. No, 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 that kill... no, that kills the king, not the king kills him. No, 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 that, that kills him. The, the blow from the, the butt of the spear kills him. Before that, though, uh, some things. Well, first, we have the Master. that's clearly bit off more than he can chew with his coup, because Queen Galea is not exactly taking the Master's shit. No. But also, we have this very long and poignant sort of speech from the Doctor, where all hope is lost, and he's talking about another day. On, well, the planet named it won't exist for another year, for another year or two, but it's Gallifrey, obviously. It's his best. And he, talk, he tells this lovely story about the blackest day of his life and going up to see an old hermit and finding the daisiest daisy. And it's, you know, it's a very... Yeah, so this is where that daisiest daisy, daisiest daisy line comes from. It's a cute scene. I've, I've seen this because Ellie, a.k.a. Tardis Monkey, has done a TikTok of her miming to this scene. Oh, cool. And I didn't know where it came from. Oh, well, here it is. Those really nice Doctor Who moments where you can just sort of sit back and think. A lot of people yeah. don't tend to like those, but I do. Yeah. I mean, we got we had we had our dumb, goofy monster bullshit. Now let's just be contemplative. It's a nice insight to his childhood, isn't it? And um, mm -hmm. interestingly, there is rather more to this than just what he talks about because he talks about an old wizened hermit. Ah, you're going to go into this, okay? If you, if you don't mind, go on, go on. So. The Hermit is not named in this story. But the Hermit actually is a character in a later John Pertwee story. In fact, his last. Yep. And I can't remember the Hermit's name, but he's referred uh, to as the Hermit. Kanpo, I believe it's. Kanpo, yeah, Kanpo. 
who actually uh, in that story actually does help uh, John Pertwee regenerate at the end. But but here's the here's the amazing thing because we've done it again for the future this time. Oh, what do you mean we've done it again for the future? Well, the actor that plays George Del- uh, the actor that plays Delius in this serial is called George Cormac. Uh-huh. Oh no! And the actor that plays the hermit in Planet of the Spiders is George Cormac. Oh wow, that's that's wild! <laughs> wild. Now he, he hadn't been cast at this point, I'm sure, but it's no, a that's... coincidence. No, the story you're talking about is like two years down the line. Of course, yeah, he, he hadn't been cast at this point. <laughs> so. We get to our climax, and uh, the master is ready to summon Kronos and uh, all this bullshit, and ex- and have uh, the Doctor and Joe as uh, snacks for Kronos, as a show of his power. Yeah, but for sacrifice. They helpfully mention to the Queen that King Dalios was killed. Yeah, which, which the master didn't want. But that you know, because he makes... knew this might happen. That makes her angry. She's ready to call the whole thing off. But the master gets to the uh, crystal control panel just in time to summon Kronos. It's car ca time, motherfuckers. Well, Krasis actually flicks the switch. Oh, Krasis does it. Well, because I, I, the, the master yeah. is seized by Galea's guards. I, yeah. I, I, he says, now Krasis, hit the switch. And he hits the switch. And all hell promptly breaks loose. Car ca motherfuckers. Kronos is flying around. Uh, Galea frees the doctor. Because the master uses the confusion to run into his TARDIS. Joe jumps onto his back. <laughs> and the master... He's running off. Yeah. So he just takes her with, with him? By the way, Atlantis is falling apart, so... Uh, oh yeah, the set is literally falling apart. This is the destruction of Atlantis, kids. It was everyone a time bird the entire dead. time. It was a time bird the entire time. Well, everyone, well, everyone's not dead if you believe that this is a prequel to Underwater Men's. Everyone important to you is dead, but I'm still here. Everyone important. Oh. I, I guess you could say that, that that Kronos doesn't like fish. Honestly, I feel the most sorry for the queen here because, I mean, once upon a time she was falling in love and now she's only totally falling apart. Well, there's nothing she can do. It's a total eclipse of the heart. I mean, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. She didn't have to plot against her king. I'm just pointing that out. But oh, also, can we point out that in the scene where um, the Master summons Kronos, uh, mm. Hippias is in the marketplace, <laughs> despite the fact that he's dead? Whoops. <laughs> I got better. It's either Hippias or someone that looks very suspiciously like him. But uh... So, here we are in our climax. It's, um, it's Hippias' twin brother, Hippios. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been strong. So, our climax here, then. Uh, Joe, is, the Master has handcuffed Joe to his TARDIS. And the doctor shows up in his and is threatening to time ram them and totally destroy both the ships. Which he ramps it up and the master basically calls his bluff. It's like, oh, you're not really going to kill us both. I know I'm going to use the time ram. And then and, uh, it's... motherfucker Joe says, fuck you, and sets it all the way up and does the time ram. And yeah. Womp Kaboom do well. well Something or other happens. There's an interesting bit before that, though, where um, the Doctor doesn't use the time ram, which forces Joe to do it, and the, and the, and the Master of Officers says, You see, I, I knew I could, I could, I could um, exploit your fatal weakness. Compassion, Doctor! <laughs> and decades later, Davros will tell him the same thing. Yep. yep. So, Joe wakes up. She's not handcuffed anymore. And she heads out of the Master's TARDIS, and we're in the void now. Yeah, the, the master's unconscious. The doctor's the, unconscious in their respective. The boy annoyingly eats part of uh, jo- of Katie Manning's outfit, but that's what that's a uh, blue screen for you in the seventies. Yeah, so yeah. she obviously had had blue on her outfit. <laughs> yeah, she did. So uh, she goes to the doctor's tarts and wakes him up and is like, "Hey, wake up, doctor! We're dead. What do you mean we're dead? <laughs> oh, we're we're like in heaven or something. Check it out." And they head out into the void. And the reason the void is a blue screen is so we can cue in a giant lady head. Yes. <laughs> this That's is actually a huge bitch. This is actually Kronos. Yep. And That's Kronos. A huge bitch. And this is Kronos's form, and there's some weird Zen dialogue about how Kronos is 
from outside of time and is thus beyond good and evil. Yeah. But the long and short of it is, oh, hey, you set me free. Thanks. In return, I'll give you whatever you want. And they're like, let's, uh, why don't you send us back to our own time, please, and thank you. Okay, sure. What about, what about the master? Oh, uh, yeah, he fucked with me. I'm going to torture him for eternity. <laughs> yeah, she wants to give him eternal torment. And Joe's like, and the best. Joe, after everything that's happened, Joe's like, please with the doctor to tell Kronos not to do it. Uh, well, even before that, the master comes out hearing this, and he gets on his knees, and he's like, Doctor, please, I don't want to be Oh, tortured. God, yes. <laughs> Him begging. And so they're like, yeah, uh, okay, fine. Yeah, hey, Kronos, can you not uh, torture the master for eternity? And the master well, runs off back into his TARDIS. Ha ha, bye, <laughs> motherfuckers! See yeah, ya! The dog's like, you're coming back, back with us to face punishment for your crimes. Like, of course I am. Oh, what's that over there? Rip! <laughs> <laughs> and Kronos is just like, oh, well, you want him to go, so he's gone. He's gone. Yeah. Anyway, see ya. So Never make a bargain with a giant deity. No. Nah. So uh, the ending of the serial, back at Cambridge, the uh, Dr. Ingram and Stuart managed to finally get the Tom Tip working and get unit to move. They bust in and they're like, what the fuck's going on? And the TARDIS materializes. Everyone's out. Tom Tit does blow up, however. Tom Tit does blow up. But they forgot one important thing. What about baby Benton? Oh, there he is. He's back to normal. And naked. I I love the way TARDIS Wiki describes this. To everyone's surprise, Benton has returned back to his original age. Only he's no longer sporting his uniform, but his birthday suit. And we even have a sitcom ending where everyone's just like, Benton's just like, was someone in mind telling me what's going on? And then everyone yeah, laughs. Everyone's, everyone's laughing apart from the break. Everyone's laughing like it's the end of Full House. And that's how we also end the, the Also the break. Like the end of Full House. And also the break. Also, also uh, the break um, is, is very taken aback by um, Joe's Atlantean outfit. Oh, yeah. Because from his point of view, not much time has, no time has passed. Mm, yeah, that's so a... that's why he's surprised by that. But yeah, Tom Tit is destroyed. Benton's back to being himself, but but naked as a jaybird. And um, he was John Levine says that he was very concerned about filming that scene. Oh gosh! All he was wearing, all he was wearing, was a nappy. Oh gosh! And he was terrified that the nappy would give way at any moment. I hope not an actual nappy. Like a life, like a, an adult sized nappy. So yeah, he he was terrified he would be revealed like a prize on a game show to the I whole cast. They, they, they couldn't have just like had him holding his his pants around him or something. Uh, Maybe, but this is just it's what John Levine weird said. To put him in an adult diaper. It yeah. is, but it's just what John Levine said. I don't even think there's a shot where you can see the diaper. No. No, and that's why I'm just like, why would you? Why would you possibly want to do that? <coughs> but yeah, that's that's how we end it. Full house, dynamite. Benton's naked. And that's the Big time house. monster. So, uh, shall we final thoughts on this bad boy? May I go first for once? You may. Go ahead. I didn't I didn't want to go first. Okay. Anyway. So, you, I believe you said this was the, the lowest ranked Pertwee serial of all on that Correct. poll. Correct. Right. I can sort of see why. Mm. Because it's extremely goofy. And Extremely Goofy does not work for a certain subset of Doctor Who fans, particularly those that write polls. Yeah. But they are wrong because, well, objectively, it may, be not be a, it may not be a great story, and certainly there's a lot of filler. The Benton as a baby thing doesn't need to happen. Quite a, a few of the things in, uh, in Cambridge doesn't need to happen. You could just set most of it in Atlantis. But, goddamn, I have to love it because... We've got great mythology. We've got a goddamn Minotaur military pressing someone through a mirror. We've got Roger Delgado, who is an absolute tour de force throughout this entire thing. I mean, he was a tour de force any time he appeared in Doctor Who, but in particular here, he is just... He doesn't just chew the scenery. He devours it and spits it back out for others to use again, because he's just that damn good. 
And John Pertwee and, and um, Katie Manning's chemistry, as, as Joe and the Doctor, has, has really started to um, to improve at this point. She's like, really enthusiastic, but also quite quite fearful, but also brave. And he no longer sees her as an annoyance. He's actually very fond of her. Uh, there's, a, there's a lovely bit where they were they were driving in Bessie and the two actors got lost. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> For real, while filming. Um, so, yeah, I can see why this isn't well liked by a certain portion of the community. I have to disagree with them vehemently. It's enjoyable. It's very enjoyable. And that Daisy is Daisy speech is beautiful. Yeah. So may I next? I'd like to. Go. Okay. Yeah. This is a. This was a fun story. I guess it's it's technically goofy, but you know me. I like I love goofy Gonzo. There are things that don't really work, like uh, the whole feminism characterization of Doctor Ingram is not that well represented. <laughs> So we have to give it a uh, demerit for that, unfortunately. Like, not that feminism is bad, just the way that these old British writers are portraying a 1970s feminist is bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, some of the Atlantis stuff, I, I remember the last time I watched this, some of the Atlantis stuff, like, graded at me just because oh we went from this weird science story to like period costume drama but on this rewatch i I was kind of vibing with it so you know it was very there and it just has a lot of weird goofy stuff there's like weird science the name tom tit a bunch of there's a little bit of padding here and there but otherwise it's pretty well structured four episodes of weird science bullshit in cambridge two episodes of atlantis and a lot of stuff tying it together so it's a better it's a better marriage of plot lines and settings than Earthshock. Mark dunked on Earthshock on your bingo cards now. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it's got some real fun moments to it. <laughs> More mirror alerts than you can shake a stick at. It's just it's kind of a goofy time and you're vibing with the story, laughing with it, not so much at it. I mean you laugh at it for some of the monster designs, but a goofy monster design can take you a long way and help the story. Like, look at Web Planet or Underwater Menace. That shit, that shit, I love it. In the same vein, I kind of love Kronos and the Minotaur here, so. This is an enjoyable John Perkery story. Some flaws, it's not perfect, but you can have a good time with it. So, uh, Kat, if you would. Uh, I have yet to pick a bad story. All of my stories have been bangers, don't at me. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this one. I mean, obviously it has its silly moments with the big flappy Kronos bird and, you know, the, the big giant face at the end talking to them, which was quite amusing. Um, but honestly, I really liked this. It was just a fun little adventure. It had, you know, like a really amazing actor playing the master who I'm very much enjoying. Um, it had a a good storyline that you could follow easily. You know, nothing was like, well, why does this happen? Why does that happen? So, overall, it was just a really fun time, and I just do not understand why fans ranked it so low, even with all these little bits to it. It was fun. It's like, you guys took everything else I was going to say, so that's all I can really say is that I had a really good time watching this. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry we took that from you. One thing I, I forgot to mention briefly is we, we mentioned that the you know the TARDIS interior wasn't very well liked by fans. No, I, I believe this was the only appearance of it too. Yeah, it got destroyed between <laughs> series nine and ten being filmed. Wow, that's interesting. Even back, what? So and they back... had to they had to make another set, and that's the yep. set that appears in the Three Doctors. Even back then, there was backlash or what? So I don't yeah. understand, like, in retrospect, people saying, oh, those RAM things were a bit weird. But even in 1972, they were, like, calling out the BBC and writing letters saying, uh, dear Dr. Who team, those RAM things are shit. Apparently, they It's, it's referred to as the washing up bowl. bowl. Yeah. The wash? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I like how we had exactly the same idea at exactly the same time. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks. So, uh, that only leaves one thing, doesn't it? Yes. What are we yeah. going to do next Yeah, your time? pick. Okay, well, my pick is going to be interesting. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, one one moment. I am now doing a thing. Uh-oh. 
Raniac and Cat can't see the thing, but Raniac, bless him, will be putting the thing into the show so that you can see it. So, if you're watching visually, of course. If you're listening audibly via oh, something. Is this the randomizer? It's, randomizer? Not, it's not the randomizer, but it's something similar. So, for context, in uh, October, I used the, ra the randomizer.net, a site that randomly selects a Doctor Who episode for you. I have chosen a different tact. I am still semi-randomly picking an episode, but I have certain criteria. I am on a website called Wheel Decide, and I have made Doctor Who Reviews Presents Coulette. We have a wheel, a goddamn wheel with a bunch of choices on it, and whatever we spin, we're going to get. So here are the categories. A classic black and white story that fandoms love, the fandom loves. I'm going by the poll here again. A classic black and white story that the fandom hates. Classic color story that the fans love. Classic color story that the fans hate. A revival series story that the fans love. Revival series story that the fans hate. Oh, look! A political story. Colin Baker, lol. This is why fans don't like Adric. And last but not least, I'm so sorry, Mike. <laughs> Oh. I know what that one might be. <laughs> yeah, you might have a guess, but I won't say it. Oh, please, please land on that one. Please land on well, that one. Well, I know which okay. one it is, so I hope it lands on that. Are y'all ready to spin the hoolette? Spin the wheel. Spin, spin the, the wheel, wheel. Make the deal. Here we go. Please, please, please. Ba -da 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 -da. We da -da -da. have landed on classic color story the fandom loves. Damn. Oh boy. So, with that in mind, we get to do another story that, Rainiac, you and I have done before on my channel. Oh, I know where this is going. We get to do it with Kat this time. Next time on Doctor Who Reviews, the broken clock is right once again, as it is Tom Baker in City of Death. Ooh. Yeah, this is the one I nearly picked as their remembrance. Uh, it's very good. This is fantastic. I won't reveal what's on what what choices corresponded to the wheel, just in case. Well, I can guess for one of them. Yeah, we can guess. I, one I, of them. You can guess one of them. Yeah. All I can say is, uh, now that the idea has been planted, beware, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I, I'm I'm just at gonna some say some point. It. If we're gonna continue doing these weekly, we are gonna have to get to it at some I, point. I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it. It's not as bad as he makes it out to be. I mean, I already found no, out but that one it of doesn't make his opinion uh, invalid. One of my favorite Doctor Who episodes, Sleep No More, is actually connected to it, so. Oh, yeah. If, if he I, doesn't I, like I, it, then he doesn't it. like it. So, uh, Raniac, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to stop my little uh, local recording and send that to you so uh, we can get rid of the wheel. By now, you've got City of Death up, so. <laughs> yep. All right. So, uh, say goodnight. Okay, so we spun the wheel and made the deal, and next time we'll be we'll be uh, watching City of Death. But before we get to that, just a little, few little bits of uh, housekeeping to take care of. Firstly, you can find us on Twitter at Reviews Doctor. You can find me on Twitter at Reniac the Maniac. Jerry's on Twitter at Freezing Inferno, and Cat's at Concave Usurper. Cat also sometimes streams video games at Twitch.tv forward slash Concave Usurper, and you can buy Back to the Iron Fire by Chris and Mattia on all good Kindle bookshops. <laughs> oh yeah, thank you, thank you. We got we got to do that. I, I you know it. we had to get it in there somehow. Of course we do. Absolutely. And if either of you were going to step to the plate, I have to do it for you. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you to Jerry and Cat for talking about a rather fun time with the Time Monster. Thank you to you, the audience, for listening to talk about the Time Monster. And next time, join us for what some consider to be Tom Baker's greatest story, City of Death. Bye -bye. So until then. Bye for now. Jesse Cox is a furry.